I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. Good evening. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Once again, folks, make sure that you have pen and paper by your side because, once again, we're going to talk about something that you need to know and something that also some people are going to find extremely controversial. Be that as it may, we're still going to talk about it. I'm tired. We took the dogs up on top of the mountain today to run and play in the deep snow and... Uh, Got stuck twice, and that's with a four-wheel drive vehicle. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, and I worked my tail off getting out of there. So I'm a little bit sore and very tired. So I hope that will take that into consideration if I make some mistakes tonight. We're going to uh, be discussing British Israelism, known in this country as Christian Identity. It is a racist doctrine that proclaims a master race descended from the house of David. Actually, farther back than that. <laughs> they claim that they are the descendants of Seth and that everybody else in the world are the descendants of Cain. And uh, if you ain't one of them, you ain't nothing. You ain't nobody and they don't want you around. Simple as that. They're racist in everything that they do and say, although if you ask them about it, they will tell you that they are racialists. <laughs> and that they really don't have any objections to other races, they just don't want to live with them. And I'm here to tell you that's the biggest bunch of BS you ever heard in your life. If these people ever came to a position of real power, by real power I mean control, they would destroy anyone who doesn't believe as they believe, who doesn't look like they look, and isn't of their race. Now, I'm not just whistling Dixie here, folks. I've studied these people for a long time. I didn't even really know they existed until I started doing my radio broadcast. And uh, all of a sudden I started getting pamphlets and books and Letters of congratulations from these people who all thought for some reason that because I opposed the tyranny of those who would destroy this country, that I was somehow one of them. And when they found out that I was not, that I was part Native American, and that I was married to a Chinese woman, I got baskets full and bushets, bushels full and the uh, Big boxes full of the most vicious, vile, despicable, uncouth, hate mail that I ever imagined anyone could ever get in their entire life or that ever existed. I just simply did not know that this type of thing was going on. And uh, they even attacked my wife and children for no reason at all other than they are who they are. <laughs> and so I thought, gee, I better find out who these people are really quick because they're dangerous. They want to destroy my children simply because they're not pure Aryan. Now that uh, made me very angry. And uh, it makes a lot of other people angry also. They claim that they are the true Israelites. Now, this is the strangest claim I've ever heard in my life, ladies and gentlemen, because I've never met one of these people who speaks Hebrew, who actually celebrates the actual Hebrew holidays that the Israelites practiced. They can't read Hebrew. And uh, they mistranslate all the time. Of course, they mistranslate in their favor. <laughs> But nevertheless, they mistranslate all the time. They'll take somebody else's translation and twist the meaning to mean what they want it to mean because they don't 
really understand the original Hebrew. <clears throat> they are descendants of Northern Europeans. Now, this is really easy to research, folks. Anybody can do it. You can go back and research the records of the Roman Empire when they went into Northern Europe. When they met the Celts and the Picts and the Gauls and the Teutonic tribes of Germany. These were not Hebrews, ladies and gentlemen. They were not the descendants of Hebrews at all. These were wild men. And I mean wild in every sense of the word. They went into battle stark naked, covered with clay. Uh, the Picts were famous for that. I could go on and on and on. They were steeped in nature worship. None of the original religious aspect of the Hebrews came into play with any of these tribes whatsoever. Another strange claim by these people, the British Israelites, is that they are the, the original progenitors, so to speak, the creators of civilization. Yet, in the Middle East, in Africa, and in Asia, there were great civilizations that existed long before these people ever even learned to put a loincloth on, much less become civilized. Their answer to that is that they descended from those Eastern and Middle Eastern civilizations and that they arrived in Northern Europe by some great circuitous route of migration. That doesn't wash either, ladies and gentlemen. If you study these people, you'll find that they most probably came, and I'm talking about the Northern European, uh, Europeans, they most probably according to scientists, but you can't really trust them either. You see, they say the American Indians came to North America across a land bridge from Siberia, and they're really Mongols <laughs> who, who uh, you know, changed over a period of time and became uh, North American uh, Indians. What we call Indians, they're not Indians at all, they're just North Americans. Um, but the American Indians say that that's not true. They have their own history. And they dispute that. And uh, modern science has a way of changing its story through the years anyway. But they say that the Northern Europeans actually migrated from India. Now, I've been to India several times in my life, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I haven't seen anybody in the country of India, even in the highest caste groups, that resemble Northern Europeans. Sorry, but there just isn't anybody there uh, who has that kind of resemblance. The ancient Hebrews did not look like Northern Europeans either. Another claim made by these people is that Adam, <laughs> the father of the human race, and, and I can't understand why they make this, this sort of distinction, because Adam was the father of Seth and Cain. But they claim, claim, they claim, they claim Cain was not produced by a union between Adam and Eve, but by a union between Adam and, uh, excuse me, but uh, Eve and Satan. And they claim that uh, Cain was the offspring of that union between Eve and Satan. <clears throat> It's all baloney, folks. It's the biggest crock of baloney that anybody's ever spouted ever in history. One of their, uh, one of their uh, explanations of this is that the true son of Adam was white. And that Adam actually means blood in the cheeks. When you research that word, you'll find that that's not what it means at all. They claim that Cain was actually a dark-skinned child born of the union between Eve and Satan. You know, there is... <laughs> this, this, it really gets wild, folks. It really does. And uh, when you research this name of Adam, you find that it means no such thing. It does not mean blood in the cheeks. 
and it comes from a long line of myths that existed long before the Bible was ever written, or the uh, Jews became a nation, or the Hebrews became a nation known as Israel. And uh, I'm just going to read to you a couple of short paragraphs from the Holy Grail by Malcolm uh, Godwin, who himself is a British Israelist, but he tells the truth. And so that's what we're interested in this broadcast. He says, and I quote, So far we have examined the historical bloodlines, but the blood which courses through the veins of the Grail myth carries with it the hint of something far more dangerous and powerful, like some dark magical ingredient which runs far deeper in ancient tunnels of the collective unconscious. We briefly glimpse the dark spring tides under the moon and the quickening of life. At the time when the Grail legends first appeared, it was generally accepted that the blood women spilled at the moon was responsible for new birth. They didn't know the biological functioning of the sexual organs or the process of the creation of a fetus in the womb. They had no idea at that time. So they believed... that the blood woman, women spilled at the moon, or their menstrual period, was responsible for new birth. Here's what he says about that. Blood which was retained in the womb was believed to coagulate into a child. Even Aristotle claimed that human life is a coagulum of menstrual blood. While the Roman Pliny, author of the Encyclopedia Natural History, insisted that it formed the material substance of generation. This curious notion was still taught in European medical schools only 200 years ago, ladies and gentlemen. Far earlier, the ancient Mesopotamian goddess Ninhursag was said to have created humankind out of clay mixed with her, quote, blood of life, end quote. The Jews, the Muslims, and the Christians borrowed this and similar creation myths to form their own. Now listen to this carefully. Remember, this person is a British Israelist. And he says, quote, Even the name Adam can be traced to the feminine Adama, A-D-A-M-A-H, meaning bloody clay. So there you have it. And when you trace it back yourself, you'll find the same thing. Does not mean blood in the cheeks. Never did mean blood in the cheeks. Cannot mean blood in the cheeks. <clears throat> now I'm going to give you the research of the executive intelligence review, and this report is dated November 14, 1997. This is one of the best research organizations in the world, as far as I'm concerned. I don't particularly subscribe to their politics, but I do have great respect for their research, because I've duplicated it in almost every instance. I don't research everything they research, and they don't research everything that I have researched. But when we both research the same thing, the results are identical, which means these people are looking for the truth as I am, and they're not trying to put something in there that's not there. They tell it like it is. And so tonight, I'm going to tell it like it is. So take note of this. Make notes. Remember, Listen to everyone, read everything, believe absolutely nothing unless you can prove it in your own research. Here we go. British Israelites and Empire. One of the most glaring examples of British intelligence-sponsored psychological warfare against the United States is the bizarre ideology called variously British Israelism or Christian Identity. Victims of this foreign-sponsored ideological virus can be found to hold key positions in the Patriot Movement and other movements which may be committed to the destruction of the American Republic. Not all, not all Patriots are Christian identity or British Israelism. 
And I can assure you that British Israelism and Christian identity people who call themselves patriots are not. They have no interest in restoring the Constitution for the United States of America, ladies and gentlemen. They want to split this country, and they want the Northwest four states, the four states in the Northwest corner of the United States, as their own nation. So all of these people running around calling themselves patriots who also believe in Christian identity or British Israelism are liars. They are lying to all of us. They have been linked. They have been linked, ladies and gentlemen, to the terrorist bombing of the Alfred P. Mura Federal Building in Oklahoma City in 1995. There are many links to that bombing at a city in eastern Oklahoma called Elohim City, which is a Christian identity, British Israelist community. <clears throat> and more broadly, a significant portion of what today claims to be Christianity in American society is consciously or unconsciously based on religious belief structures designed by the British colonial office to undermine Christianity in general and the American Republican form of government in specific. British Israelism is a syncretic organization which in its simplest variant claims that the Anglo-Saxon Celtic race is the true ten lost tribes of Israel that the British sovereign is descended from King David, and that as such, an all-encompassing British empire is biblically prophesied to rule the world in the few final days before Jesus Christ touches down on the Mount of Olives and ends human history. That's what they all want you to believe. None of it is true. They are not descended from King David. They are not Hebrews. They are not the ten lost tribes of Israel. The tribes of Israel, folks, were never lost in the first place, in case you didn't know that. None of them were ever lost. The Bible does not say that they got lost. It's a scam. There are many variations on this theme. Some versions say that the horrors described in the book of Revelations have begun, and others believe that the tribulations are yet to come. Almost all, even the militant anti-Semites, look to the Mideast, to Jerusalem, and yearn for the final rebuilding of Solomon's temple, which will be the incontrovertible sign that the end of the world is nigh. These people are also rabid Zionists, ladies and gentlemen. The roots of British Israelism are obscure, but some trace it to the late Elizabethan period in England, a time which coincided with the consolidation of the Church of England and the beginnings of Britain's maritime empire, as well as the creation of a full-time secret intelligence service. It's also the time, ladies and gentlemen, when the Royal House of England had to come up with some legitimate reason to oppose the Vatican, and the Pope, and pronounce their Anglican Church the real and only true Church. And remember, there was no need for an Anglican Church <laughs> until Henry VIII wanted to get a divorce, and the Pope said no. And that was the beginning of all of this. You see, all of a sudden, King Henry VIII told the Pope to go stick it where the sun don't shine. And he divorced his wife, anyway, under the Anglican Church. And you all, you all know the, uh, the story of the opposition in England and what happened to them. And then the British monarchy had to justify all of their actions. And that's when all of a sudden, all of a sudden, right then and there, they became descended from the house of David and possessed the only really divine right to rule. Now, how did this happen? Well, folks, sometime in the near future, they're going to say that they've undercovered historical evidence that Christ did not really die upon the cross, that he fathered children with Mary, 
Magdalene. Those children, along with Joseph of Arimathea, Mary Magdalene, and the children, and the bones of Jesus Christ were taken from the Middle East to the British Isles, and uh, blah, 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 blah. Under the throne of England, there is a stone which they claim is Jacob's pillar. <laughs> and uh, anyway, let me continue with this report. It might take two nights to cover this because there's a lot to talk about here. Remember, it's all baloney. None of it is true. One person who is reputed to have contributed to the early development of the British Israel ideology is John Dee, a fellow of Trinity College and advisor to Queen Elizabeth, who openly practiced black magic and prophecy. He was among the first to talk of England as an empire. Also, Sir Francis Drake, Elizabeth's favorite pirate, was notoriously partial to describing the fledgling empire of England as Israel and the New Jerusalem. You see, folks, if they can use these terms and convince the rabble, that's you, in case you didn't know that. The socialists call you the masses. If they can convince you that it's all true, and you believe in the Bible, then you have to bow down to these people and let them rule you. You see, one of the first mind control operations. The beginning of the 17th century saw the rise of hundreds of of cults across Europe. The majority of these, including what would later be known as British Israelism, can be traced to the efforts of Venice's top psychological warfare officer, Paolo Sarpi. Venetian strategic interests demanded that Europe be kept controlled and divided, and that the scientific breakthroughs of the Renaissance and the implication of those breakthroughs for the growth of human mental freedom had to be destroyed. You see, Venice had long learned that manipulation of religion is one of the most potent methods to control societies. Heck, the, the Pope had known that from the 3rd century, when uh, the Emperor Constantine called the Council of Nicaea, and they sat down and determined what were going to be the books of the Bible, and burned and destroyed and searched out and hid or, or, or completely obliterated everything that opposed what they chose to be in the Bible. There was no Bible before. There was a whole bunch of different books that all were written by different articles, authors that claimed to tell the real history of the religion. Not just the Christian religion, but all the other religions. And the Pope, over the years, combined the early teachings of Christ, the teachings of the early church, with all of the different pagan religions, to create what is known today as modern Christianity. He even changed the day of worship from the seventh day, which is Saturday, ladies and gentlemen, to the first day, which is the venerable day of the sun, in order to pacify the sun worshippers and bring them under the control of the Catholic Church. Don't think so? Well, get your head out of the books that are written by those who want you to believe in them and start studying the real history of the world and you'll find out that it's really true. Heck, <laughs> the Pope even changed the Ten Commandments which Moses claimed were handed down to him from God. Now that's pretty arrogant, don't you think? Now I'm not anti-Catholic, I'm just pro-truth. I don't care which religion you worship, as long as you do it in the light of truth. And if you choose to worship a mixture of truth and lies, or all lies, or all truth, or something in between all of that, it's, I don't care. But all you're ever going to get from me on this broadcast is the truth. I'll fight and die for your right to worship at whatever altar, whatever God you choose. Because that's the only way I know I can have the freedom to worship at the altar and worship my God when and how I choose. You see, if I take your right away from you, I've also taken it from myself. But I've also learned over the years, ladies and gentlemen, that to live in a lie is to live a life already dead. And there is no such thing as choosing the lesser of two evils. Evil is evil. And if you choose evil, whether it's lesser or greater, you are living an evil life. I choose truth. 
And I hope you do too. See these Venetian strategies and the interests of the rulers wanted Europe controlled. And they wanted the population divided amongst, or against, I should say, itself, just like today. And they foster and promote things that will divide people against each other. They didn't want the scientific breakthroughs of the Renaissance. And any of the implications of those breakthroughs for the growth of human mental freedom to flourish, they had to be destroyed. These things were dangerous to those who ruled. Just like this broadcast is dangerous to those who rule today. What you're hearing on this broadcast, what you always hear on this broadcast, is the reason why William Jefferson Clinton, President of the United States of America, called me the most dangerous radio host in America. If you don't believe that, check around. Rush Limbaugh read it. It was written in a White House memo. Rush Limbaugh got a copy of it, read it on the air. Right after the Oklahoma City bombing in an effort to demonize me and vindicate himself. But whatever the reason, it was the greatest feather in my cap ever. It's a great compliment to me to have been so honored. Venice had long learned that manipulation of religion is one of the most potent methods to control societies. The Roman Empire knew it, used it. It's being used against you today, ladies and gentlemen. Venetian agents had a direct hand in the English King Henry VIII's break with Rome and in the creation of the Theocratic Church of England or the Anglican Church. Venice, you see, was crucial to the transformation of Martin Luther's ill-formed movement into a Europe-wide Protestant schism, and Venice was equally pivotal in shaping the Vatican's countermeasures, thus ensuring decades of religious warfare. Martin Luther, whether you realize it or not, used the seal of the Rosen Cross on his correspondence. He was a member of the secret mystery religion known as the Rosai Krusha. Within this Venetian onslaught, Paolo Sarpi's particular specialty was science. One of the greatest dangers to the oligarchical world outlook had arisen in the mid-15th century when Nicolaus of Cusa, in effect, founded modern science and threatened to sweep away the mental straitjacket of Aristotelian, Aristotelianism. Why do they have to make words? Why do they have to put an ism <laughs> on Aristotle? Why can't they say the mental straitjacket of Aristotle? <laughs> Sarpy's job was to repackage Aristotle's discredited method in seductive new ways. Sarpy's primary tool was what we today call empiricism. The insistence that science is not based on creativity but is merely the discovery of the rules of nature, which we deduce from the facts which impinge upon our senses. Now, Aristotle wasn't a bad guy. He wasn't discredited. Aristotle was the father of reason, ladies and gentlemen. In case, in case, you, uh, in case you believe what the, the EIR said right there. As a skilled intelligence operator, Sarpy did not simply create one ideological package, but several. Then, whichever one took hold could be further sponsored. Some cult variants were designed to appeal to scientists and had little to say about religion. Others were openly religious. Some flavored for Catholics, some for Protestants. And yet others were meant to draw in people who were confused about religion in general. Sarpy relied heavily on the ideas originally developed by Gnosticism. Of course. And a Gnostic would, of course, ladies and gentlemen, say that Aristotle was wrong. 
Gnosticism was a cult of obscure Eastern origin which held that the universe, including the deity itself, was absolutely divided into spirit and the filthy degeneration of spirit called matter. A key belief of the Gnostics was that transcendence from the world of matter was dependent on secret knowledge. Gnosis means knowledge, which was attainable only by an elite of the sect who had achieved purity and had become born again out of the evil flesh. In other words, the hierarchy of the adepts known as the Illuminati. In the 11th and 12th centuries, Europe had seen large-scale Gnostic heresies, notably the Cathari, or pure ones, and their violent suppression. This Gnostic secret knowledge ideology is what Sarpy and his two famous collaborators, Galileo, Johannes Kepler. Under the Gnostic methodology, science explicitly becomes the same as alchemy, prophecy, or magic, which are all just a matter of hitting upon the right combination of chemicals, the right incantation, the plausible interpretation, <laughs> or the illusion. This took many forms, including a few which contributed directly, ladies and gentlemen, to British Israelism. Francis Bacon, whom many classify as the founder of modern scientific method, explicitly saw science as nothing more than forcibly wresting from nature the secrets that God, a Gnostic deity containing good as well as evil, has maliciously refused to reveal. Bacon's text, The New Atlantis, which suggested that England could become the site of the new King Solomon's Temple, became the founding document of the British scientific espionage operation known as the Royal Society and the source of what is known as this country as America's secret destiny. It was here that Bacon coined the ominous phrase, quote, knowledge is power, end quote. This original Royal Society held alchemy and ghost hunting on the same scientific level as astronomy and chemistry. Another cult spun out of the Sarpy network, which contributes to many forms of British Israel, as well as to Freemasonry and Theosophy, is Rosicrucianism. Martin Luther was a member of that organization. Here again, the earliest origins are obscure and include unverifiable reference to the Crusading Knights Templar, officially the Poor Knights of the Temple of Solomon, and the various satanic cults. I can tell you absolutely that they can be traced right to the door of the Knights Templar. According to Masonic legend, a small group of Knights Templar escaped the Inquisition for the Order's practice of the Eastern Baphomet cult whose initiation right involved spitting on the visage of Christ to fight with King David Bruce at the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314, thereby engendering the origins of British Freemasonry and of Rosicrucianism Within higher order Freemasonry, the degree of Rose Cross is known as the degree of revenge against the Pope and the French King. Thus, the Jacobinites of the Duke de Orleans, Philip Eagleite, during the French Revolution, were known to be followers of Neo Templarism. Don't go away, folks. We'll be right back after this very short pause while I sort of wet my whistle with a cup of water here. Remember, folks, if your search for a militia to join, if you find a militia that tells you that you have to be a Christian to be a member of that militia, it's not a militia, it's a religious army. The militia is defined by law. So, and we've given you that law many times on this broadcast. If you want to see it again, go to our website, harvest-trust.org. It's all there. Just go down to the thing that says militia on our home page, click it, the militia page will come up and you'll have hours and hours of stuff to read and do there. Places to go. Things to look at. And uh, I hope you do. I hope you've all been to our web page at least once. You should visit as 
many times as you possibly can. I mean, you could literally stay on our web page for weeks and not see and explore everything. That's how big it is. That's how good it is. It's a place for people who want to discover the truth. And here's the name again. All you need is HTTP colon slash slash harvest dash trust dot o r g. Head on out. Take a look at it. See what you think. And uh, then leave a message on our voices page, which is a forum where you can talk to other people who visit the web page all across this country. Let me see here. Where was I? I'll endeavor to find my place. Here it is. Notwithstanding their primordial roots, the Rosicrucians' strict adherence to a system of esoteric secret knowledge made them grist for Sarpy's Gnostic Mill. One of the few solid pieces of evidence we have about Rosicrucianism is that it was popularized in the early 17th century by a book by German theologian Johann Valentin Andrea, titled Fama Fraternitatis. That's Fama Fraternitatis. Andrea's book described the fictional activities of one Christian Rosenkreutz, who after studying the magical theories of the East, returned to found a new society. Andrea's book was used as an organizing document by several of Bacon's more occult-oriented contemporaries, including Robert Flood and Sir Elias Ashmole, later the founder of speculative Freemasonry, with its first lodge in London in 1717. The introduction to Sama Fraternine Titus is a reprint from the works of Trajano Baccalini a Venetian theologian and a close friend of Sarpy. I believe that's Bacciolini. I believe that's the correct pronunciation. Trajano Bacciolini, a Venetian theologian and a close friend of Sarpy, and who also wrote La Balancia Politica, the first book in history to describe the need for a balance of power to rule Europe. At the same time, Sarpy's operations also encompassed several strictly religious ideologies. Venice had previously encouraged the most extreme Protestant forms, like Calvinism and its English variant, Puritanism, while simultaneously working to harden and militarize Catholicism against them. In the early 17th century, Sarpy's collaborators, like the oligarchical Sandys brothers in England, and the legal theorist Hugo Grotius in Holland began calling for a yet a new religion which would supposedly chart a third way between the extremes of Calvin's theocracy and the Vatican Jesuits. Typically, ladies and gentlemen, this new form would be based on Gnostic-style secret knowledge, the discovery of the original form, the Prisca Theologica, as they called it, of Christianity before, as they claim, it was deformed by the early church, including St. Paul, and lost to man. <laughs> well, at least they're correct in that respect, folks. That's the truth. There is no, there is no church, organization, or group on the face of this earth today that calls itself Christian that actually practices what Christ taught and what the early first Christians believed and practiced. And that's the truth. I don't care what you call yourselves, and I don't care how mad this statement makes you, and I don't care how much you hate me for saying it, it is the truth. I was amazed, because I was baptized in the Southern Baptist Church in Midwest City, Oklahoma, when I was, what, 13 years old, I believe. And I believed what they taught me and uh, read the Bible and thought that it was all the way it was supposed to be. And I had been around to other churches, had been to many other religions, as a matter of fact. 
in my travels with my father as a boy. He was an Air Force officer. And for most of my boyhood, we lived in foreign countries. And so I got a good exposure to most of the religions of the world. I can remember when we lived in the Azor Islands, which are Portuguese. The maid used to take us on Sunday to the Catholic Church. And so, I was exposed to these things. It wasn't until I really began researching the history of the world, and believe me, folks, I did not want to find what I found. I was not looking to prove myself or my religion wrong. Not at that time. Today I'm looking for the truth. I don't care what gets proven wrong because I've learned that most of us live our entire lives in a complete fantasy, in a complete deception of lies and manipulations without even knowing it, never looking to see if it's true or not. Most of us belong to the church we belong to simply because our parents did. Or, as a young and impressionable age, we were proselytized or recruited into it. And usually when we're recruited into it, we're not told the truth. We find that out sometime later. Very few people who belong to any church in this world today ever set out to study all the different religions and churches and theosophy and theology and mystical, or I should say mysticism, in order to find out which one is really telling the truth and which one is really the right one for them to belong to. It doesn't happen. Whatever church they end up in becomes the only right church with the only correct dogma and the only right message and the only path to heaven. Everybody else is going to hell. Isn't that the way it works? <laughs> Isn't that the way it works, ladies and gentlemen? And of course, every preacher and every member of his church can pick Bible passages out of context to support whatever it is that they say is right. Without fail, they can all do that. See, I don't think that if the Bible is the inspired Word of God, that God would want it ever to be used in that manner, to tell you the truth. The writer Edwin Sandys even stated that this new religion should be an amalgamation of the Church of England, plus the kind of Catholicism then practiced in places like Venice. Much of the religious history of 17th century England can be characterized as various factions, attempts to decipher the secrets of the Bible and revive the, quote, old-time religion, end quote. Indeed, much of the original theology of such modern groups as the Quakers, the Pietists, and the Unitarians derives from these debates. And if anybody ever got close, it's the Quakers. This is a major reason why the Cromwellian Revolution of the mid-century saw intense public debates over biblical texts that might be used to proclaim that English law was in conformity with the laws of the Israelites and allowed the Roundheads to claim that London was the new Jerusalem. Oliver Cromwell's offer to let the Jews return to England after centuries of exile, ladies and gentlemen, was not humanitarian. And Oliver Cromwell did not all of a sudden come up with some great love for Jews. It was made in the hope that the Jews could somehow reveal their biblical secrets and that somehow this action would give legitimacy to the claim of the royal house of England to be direct descendants of the house of David and the real Israel. John Milton's intense study of the Kabbalah and other Jewish exoteric, esoteric, I should say, texts was to the same end. And the Kabbalah, ladies and gentlemen, 
has become the basic tenet of the secret religion of all of the so-called secret fraternal orders and secret societies of the world. Even after the monarchy was restored in 1660, the, deba the debate merely intensified. Typical is Sir Isaac Newton, who was devoted to the search for Prisca Theologica, a Freemason in the tradition of Sir Elias Ashmole. Newton studied alchemy and corresponded with John Locke on the subject. Like Archbishop James Usher at the beginning of the century, Newton claimed to have divined the secret chronology of the Bible. In his book, The Chronology of Ancient Kingdoms, Newton presented a scheme for the rebuilding of Solomon's Temple. Many of Newton's last years were spent writing notes for a book of prophecy based on the revelation of St. John, in which he described the ultimate destruction of the Antichrist by which he meant the Roman Pope. By Newton's time, England had not only taken over the oligarchy's imperial mantle from Venice, it had also become the cult center of the world. And just as Scarpy had planned, the corruption of the religious belief was vital to the corruption of scientific understanding. A very large reason why Newton's empiricist theories became so widespread was that they conformed to the new corrupt theologies. Indeed, the English clergy and their colleagues became Newton's greatest popularizers. The one person who fully understood this was the greatest scientist of his day, Gottfried Leibniz. When the Royal Society realized that they must use Newton to destroy Leibniz's influence and began an international defamation campaign, Leibniz responded in a famous series of letters to Newton's friend Dr. Samuel Clark. And it is telling that Leibniz opened what was to be one of the great works of science with the line, quote, natural religion itself seems to be declining in England, end quote. <laughs> Understatement, don't you think? There are millions of Americans, ladies and gentlemen, who are now involved in Pentecostal, charismatic, and millennialist religious activity, including some who may be reading this right now. Having good feelings about those activities is not enough. That can be pure salesmanship. Simply knowing that your group is involved in good works is not enough. The New Testament warns against that kind of thinking. There are a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing these days demanding that you look beneath the surface and find out what are the core beliefs of your congregation. You may be shocked to find that your co-religionists have ideas which make it impossible for them to understand any kind of real research on this issue. Ask your minister or your priest or your friends and find out. Start a fight and do it intentionally because that's how the truth comes out. Very quickly, you will see some lies flung out in defense. The single most important test is what your congregation believes about man being in the image of God. This point is often taken for granted because the scripture tells us that God made man and woman in his image. And therefore, if you believe scripture, you believe that. Not so. There's a lot of Protestant denominations that believe that Adam and Eve were made in the image of God, but that this image was hopelessly tarnished after their fall. Therefore, some say only the saved are truly in the image of God and the rest of humanity are second-class souls. Now, this kind of thinking often afflicts the person who is loudly opposed to anything that would take a life before birth, theoretically saving an elected soul, but who cannot muster much care for those lazy souls that God has apparently abandoned to their faith. And another important clue to what your congregation really believes can be found in their understanding of the role of reason in the worship of God. For instance, many people who call themselves fundamentalists become quite agitated at the mention of Philo, the Jewish philosopher of Alexandria, of the church father Augustine, the best-selling apocalyptic Hal Lindsay and John Walwood have both written tracts against Philo because the Platonic philosopher proved that any attempt at scriptural prophecy was a narcissistic and impious attempt to make God conform to man's schedule. 
Scripture, said Philo, was a metaphor. And I've said it many times on this broadcast. It's true. Subject to a deepening interpretation as man grows in understanding. Augustine usually gets a blast for subscribing to Philo on this and related points. But what really perturbs the apocalyptics is Philo's and Augustine's absolute insistence that worship can never be irrational. As Philo beautifully puts it, God insists that his worshipers offer him only the first fruits. And for man, says Philo, that first fruits to be offered must be our creative reason. That's a sidebar written by Michael Minnesina. Although the preconditions for British Israelism were rampant in England, the first formal statement of the ideology did not occur until the 1790s, when Richard Brothers, a Royal Navy officer, who had fought against America in the Revolutionary War, began to write that England was not just theoretically the New Jerusalem, but that the English people themselves were descended from the lost tribes of Israel, and that they must restore the temple in Palestine. Now, you see how it's transcended here? First, the British people were just the British people. Then, all of a sudden, when Henry VIII could not get a divorce, he broke from the Catholic Church and had to have a reason why his church could exist and was superior to the Pope. That reason was that the monarchy was descended from the house of David and that England was, was ladies and gentlemen, the actual ten lost tribes of Israel and London was the new Jerusalem. None of it true. Later, a British sea captain says that it is the English people themselves. Never mind that there was never any lost tribes of Israel. They can all be accounted for. Every one of them, folks. And he said that they must restore the temple in Palestine. The time for such theory was not right. Brothers was suspected of being a radical and was ultimately confined to an insane asylum, but his philosophy is exactly what has been adopted, and now it's not just the English people, ladies and gentlemen, it is the Aryan race comprising all the Anglo-Aryan peoples of the Northern European continent and all of those descended from those people who occupied the North American continent in the United States of America and Canada. So, it's gone through three stages. But we're only at the second stage here in what we're studying. <laughs> oh, I bet there's some angry people out there. I bet they're really just seething. They don't like me. One night, ladies and gentlemen, here's, here's my lineage. I'm English, Scotch, Irish, Native American. My wife is Chinese. My children are English, Scotch, Irish, Native American, and Chinese. Okay? I'm not Jewish. I'm not Hebrew. Never claimed to be. There's nobody in my family tree that we can find who is Hebrew or Jewish whatsoever. If I were, I would be just as proud of that as I am of being Native American, English, Scotch, and Irish. And, and I would be just as proud that my children would have that blood in them because people are just people, folks, until they're sucked into these scams and manipulations and it's used to control them and then they use it to control others and then they become bad and evil people. You see? But one night, Pastor Pete Peters, one of the biggest leaders of the British Israelist movement in the United States and what's called a Christian identity, did a whole radio broadcast about how me and anyone else who criticized the British Israelism in this country are Jews. And he even had a phone call from somebody who said that uh, he had read my book, and in my book is a picture of my mother and father. He said, my mother and father look like Jews, therefore I must be a Jew and they're Jews. Well, my mother and father don't look like Jews. Um, there is a stereotyped image of Jewry. Some Jews 
fit that a little or a lot. Uh, most Jews look like everybody else walking down the street and you wouldn't be able to tell them apart no matter if, if you had a divining rod and a crystal ball. That's the truth. But anyway, my mother and father don't fit that stereotype, neither do I. And uh, most Jews don't either, ladies and gentlemen. The point is that these people are just absolutely rabid in the methods that they use to pull some anything out of thin air that will legitimize their position when they can't sit down and prove it with facts and argue it with reason. And uh, so since I've been one of their greatest critics ever since I discovered who they were, when they sent me bushels of bushels and bushels of the hate mail, threatening to kill me and my wife and my children, labeling me as a race traitor, saying my children were mongrels and that they were uh, um, fourth-rate uh, animal people, and what do they call them? Mud people. Called, them, called my children mud people and said that they should be exterminated uh, and they had no intelligence whatsoever. Uh, you know, and every time I see these people, I see their children. It's amazing that my daughter could read when she was three years old. She's seven now and reads better than most high school graduates, or excuse me, college graduates, I meant to say, and I mean that sincerely. Um, and, and when I see these people, their excuse for not having their children already brought up to that level is that they're not old enough. <laughs> Good night, folks. I just can't do this anymore. We'll continue where I left off tomorrow night. Uh, and uh, we'll see what, what happens then, okay? Don't you think this is interesting? God bless each and every single one of you. Don't miss tonight, tomorrow night's broadcast. We've got a lot more to cover. We just barely scratched the surface, folks. That's the truth. One of the claims by British Israelites is that they're being exterminated through forced marriage to mud people. Meaning, of course, other races. I've never seen that, have you? You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Today is January the 12th, 1998. And uh, the world is not in good shape, ladies and gentlemen. This nation is not in good shape. You are very quickly losing your heritage. Losing your liberties, your freedom. Your children are losing their opportunities that so many Americans died to hand down to their posterity, or so they thought. I want you to make good note of tonight's broadcast. It is a continuation of that which we did on Friday. This one will be the clarifying mixture, I suspect. And for those of you who don't understand any of it, if you're a Christian and you want to know the truth, just go to the New Testament and read only the words in red. Don't bother with any other word in the whole book. Read only the words in red, for they will lead you to the right path and to the gate, which is Narrow. <laughs> you see, everybody spends so much time allowing themselves. And when I say allowing, I mean it wholeheartedly, for it's the truth. Allowing themselves to be grasped in the coils of deception. If you're a Christian, you know that the great deceiver, the great liar, the great manipulator, is called Satan. If you want to know where Satan re resides, if you want to know who he is, look around and see who is telling you all the lies. It's as simple as that. Who's lying to you, entrapping you, deceiving you, manipulating you, entrapping you, wrapping the coils of the serpent around you. And of course, if you're not a Christian, you're some other religion. The same thing applies, ladies and gentlemen, even if you don't believe in a Satan. Lies and deception and manipulation are wrong. 
Wrong, wrong, wrong. And the only people who practice those things are evil people. You see, they have to lie to you, deceive you, and manipulate you, because if they told you the truth, you would throw them into prison and lock them up forever. Now, if you're a Christian and you want to know the truth, go to the red words in the Bible. Don't bother reading any other word in the whole book. They will confuse you. And when you're listening to someone preaching from a pulpit, go look up the red words in the book and see what Jesus Christ himself said. If you're not a Christian, find out who's telling the lies. And do it honestly. Leaving your preconceived notions, your prejudices, and your own agenda behind you when you look for the truth. For if you're looking to prove something that you already believe, you will only find evidence to support it. You will not ever discover the truth. And the truth is so important, for this is the age of deception. Almost everyone in the world today is leading a life of fantasy, lies, deception, and they are being manipulated by the fathers, the perpetrators, the inventors of those lies. For instance, I really don't have to spend hours on this British Israelite master race, God's chosen people, all this other kind of stuff thing. All I have to do is quote one thing that Jesus Christ himself said. For all of this is being manipulated in Christianity and Zionism. And it's all a lie. Jesus Christ said, Whosoever shall believeth in me shall have everlasting life. He didn't say anything about Whosoever that belongs to the Anglo-Saxon Aryan race that believeth in me shall have everlasting life. He didn't say that. He didn't say, Whosoever is descended from the house of David and believeth in me shall have everlasting life. He didn't say, Whoever is black and believeth in me shall have everlasting life. He didn't say any of that, did he? And if you don't believe in Christianity and the Bible then you have to understand that if you submit to the concept of a master race, if you are of that race, then you are just trying to make yourself feel better and elevate yourself above the rest of humanity. And when you do that, there's nothing masterful about you. It actually lowers you in comparison to the rest of of the human race. Understand that. Make sure you take notes and open your eyes today, hopefully, like they've never been opened and maybe spare you a lot of pain, a lot of living in fantasy, a lot of manipulation. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, none of this British Israelism stuff ever surfaced in the entire history of the world until King Henry VIII wanted to divorce his wife and found out that the Pope would not let him. So, King Henry VIII divorced all of England and himself from the Catholic Church, from the Pope, founded the Anglican Church, and then it became necessary to justify his actions to the world, to the English people in specific, and to be able to make it stick. Somewhere down the line, the Royal House of England invented a family tree connecting them directly by descendants to the Royal House of David and thus to the Old Testament, the lineage of the divine right to rule, or so they claim.
Later, they claimed that all of England, not just the royal house, but all of England, this came later, folks, it was not there in the beginning, all of England were the descendants of the ten lost tribes of Israel, which according to the Bible were never lost at all, <laughs> and uh, are not lost today. And that uh, London was the New Jerusalem. And then later, they extended that to the entire Anglo-Saxon race, cutting off the German peoples, claiming that the ancient Aryans were the enemies of the state of Israel, or the race of Israel, as they have come to make it. And then later forgot all about that, and reabsorbed the Aryan, so now it's the Aryan Anglo-Saxon American people. <laughs> Discounting the original Native Americans, of course. And we'll take off from there. Still, from the strategic studies of the Executive Intelligence Review, dated November the 14th, 1997. Although the preconditions for British Israelism were rampant in England, the first formal statement of the ideology did not occur until the 1790s, when Richard Brothers, a Royal Navy officer who had fought against America in the Revolutionary War, began to write that England was not just theoretically the New Jerusalem, but that the English people themselves were descended from the lost tribes of Israel, and that they must restore the temple in Palestine. The time for such theory was not ripe, and Brothers was suspected of being a radical, and was ultimately confined to an insane asylum, which is exactly what they should be doing with Pastor Pete Peters and all of these other uh, people who are propounding this nonsense to the world and sucking a lot of innocent people into the coils of that old serpent. Around 1840, however, a decision was made somewhere at the Colonial Office, or the East India Company headquarters, to revive Sarpy's old method of religious manipulation, and the next few years would see the rise of two interrelated cults, which would become a major weapon in British foreign policy. First, Irish clergyman John Nelson Darby started publishing texts which he claimed decoded the secrets of the Bible and prophetically laid out the fast-approaching apocalypse. Darby's theories, which we today call pre-millennial dispensationalism, had several striking components. Number one, the millennial kingdom of Christ will sweep away all civilization and the only people saved will be a tiny group of elect who will be raptured physically into the new kingdom. Two, the evil power in the world is Gog, spelled G-O-G, -G, as identified in Ezekiel, who will sweep down on Israel and begin the end days. Darby confidently identified Gog as Russia. And three, the end will come only when the scripture is fulfilled and the Jews return to Israel and build the temple. How did the state of Israel come into existence, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Check your history. Almost simultaneously, one John Wilson picked up the theories of Richard Brothers and published Lectures on Our Israelitish Origin in 1840, claiming, also on the evidence of biblical secret knowledge, that the ten tribes migrated to Europe after the destruction of the Second Temple, primarily turning into Christian Englishmen and Germans. The racially inferior tribes of Judah, said Wilson, remained in Palestine and became the modern Jews, and they believed that and preached that for a long time. And today, they say, the Jews that call themselves Jews today and speak Hebrew and practice the, the ancient Hebrew uh, religious ceremonies and holidays... Uh, <laughs> are not Jews at all. They're not Jews at all. They're not even from the tribe of Judah now today. See, these people change their story about every 20 years. No, they're really, they're really 
folks from some weird tribe in the uh, mountains of what used to be called the old Soviet Union. Khazars is the name. The British Israelites claim there are no real Jews alive today. I know a lot of real Jews who find that extremely shocking. <coughs> and they're not Khazars. They are the real descendants of the real Israelites and the real ten tribes. They are of the race known as Shemites or Semites, which include the Arab people also. <laughs> so we went from their teaching that the uh, the racially inferior tribes of Judah remained in Palestine and became the modern Jews. It's, that flies in the face of everything they say. Because if you've studied the history of the Middle East, you know that the state of Israel was not that ruled, ladies and gentlemen, by the house of David. The house of David was of the tribe of Judah. The house of David and the tribe of Judah warred against and conquered the state of Israel. That's the true history of the region. Yet these people claim that they have the divine right to rule, and they are superior race to all of the people because they are descended from the house of David and the original Hebrew race from the state of Israel, the ancient country of Israel, which wasn't a country that encompassed all of the ten tribes of Israel. There were several small countries, the most powerful of which emerged as the tribe and the country of Judah and conquered all the rest under the house of David. Don't believe it? Look it up. These people are so confused they can't even find their way to a library and a history book. Both of these bizarre theories were sponsored by the British oligarchy because they exactly fit the Crown's policy requirements. Darby's identification of Russia would be crucial to drumming up support for the war against the country which the British would shortly provoke in the Crimea. Wilson's biblically sanctioned friendship with the Germans was also British policy. The fraud of the whole thing is exposed when slightly later, British foreign policy turned against the Germans. Immediately, Wilson's organization was factionalized, and it was discovered by the winning faction that the Germans were actually, get this folks, the racial heirs of the Assyrians, the ancient enemy of Israel, and therefore the enemy of British Israel. The Germans, of course, have always claimed descendancy from what they call the Aryans of India. <laughs> Actually, it's a term that was invented by Helena Petrovny Blavatsky. And both Darbyites and the British Israelites provided invaluable assistance in firmly turning the attention of the British population to Palestine and the need for the rebuilding of the temple. The timing was crucial. In 1840, British Foreign Secretary Lord Palmerston had unofficially committed the British Empire to Zionism. That's no secret. I've been telling you that for many, many years. And the creation of a British-controlled entity in Palestine and that, folks, is the real secret to the creation of the state of Israel in the Middle East. On the one hand, Britain needed to ensure that the increasing chaos in the Ottoman Empire did not invite other great powers from developing influence there. On the other, it needed to protect the land routes to India and its growing colonial empire. It also, ladies and gentlemen, would give people who believe in the 
prophecies of the Bible and the book of Revelation, the belief that prophecy was being fulfilled and would further elevate the British Israelites as the superior or master race in the world. This became official policy in 1845 with a colonial office report proposing, quote, the establishment of a Jewish nation in Palestine as a protected state under the guardianship of Great Britain, end quote. Such a state, the report concluded, quote, would place us in a commanding position in the Levant from whence to check the process of encroachment to overawe our enemies and, if necessary, repel their advance, end quote. The Crown's case officer for this project was Anthony Ashley Cooper, the 7th Earl Shaftesbury, a pious oligarch who combined aspects of both the Darbyites and the British Israelites, cleaned them up for general consumption, and became the leading spokesman for a plan to resettle Jews back in Israel. Shaftesbury's high church version of British Israelism, as well as the various low church versions, grew through the 19th century. Queen Victoria's daughter, Princess Alice, became a patroness of the movement. In 1862, the Prince of Wales and future King Edward VII made a tour of the Holy Land, the first English royal to set foot there since 1270. In 1865, Shaftesbury's efforts came to fruition with the founding of the Palestine Exploration Fund, known as PEF, under the official patronage of the Queen. The PEF brought together funding from the Rothschilds and the United Grand Lodge of Freemasons. There's those Freemasons again. Membership ranged from oligarchs to apocalyptic crazies. And again, religion made a brilliant cover for espionage and colonial manipulation. Nominally charged with surveying the Mideast so that the country could be restored by the Jews to its ancient prosperity, the Palestine Expeditionary Force spent its time subverting the Ottoman governor and making the maps that the British Army would use in the area in World War I. One of PEF's leading explorers in Palestine from 1867 to 1870 was General Sir Charles Warren. According to British author Stephen Knight, Warren who had been Commissioner of London's Metropolitan Police, and a Freemason, and a Freemason, oversaw the cover-up of the Jack the Ripper murders, protecting both the United Grand Lodge of Freemasons and the fact that the Prince of Wales had had an illegitimate heir by a prostitute. The Chief of Criminal Investigations on the case for Scotland Yard was Sir Robert Anderson, who was a follower of John Nelson Darby. Warren is credited by Masonic sources with virtually rediscovering the project of rebuilding Solomon's Temple. He founded the Quatuor Coronati Lodge 2076, which, under the guise of being the, quote, research lodge, end quote, within the United Grand Lodge of England, has been active to this day collaborating with Zionists in attempts to create holy war in the Middle East by blowing up the Muslim shrine Haram al-Sharif on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem in order to rebuild Solomon's Temple. Ironically, when the Quetuor Coronati Lodge succeeded in taking over Theosophy, it spun off the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, run by the satanic SIS officer Aleister Crowley, who was a major influence upon the Thule Society that gave birth to Adolf Hitler's movement and much of the inner cult belief structure of the Allgemeine SS. If you study the history of Nazi Germany, you'll find that it came right out. Right out of the occult lodges of the Thule Society and Freemasonry. In 1919, the 40-odd British Israelite organizations were consolidated into the British Israel World Federation, also known as BIWF. 
which today spans the British Empire and permeates the United States. The first patrons of the BIWF were the Marchioness of Hedford and Admiral Sir Richard Pierce. This consolidation followed two developments that were the work of British leaders who had been influenced by British Israelism. The first was the 1917 conquest of Palestine and entry into Jerusalem by Field Marshal Lord Allenby, which was intended to achieve a Palestinian mandate for the British Empire at the Versailles Peace Conference. The second, which sought to give an imaginative purpose to a British mandate, was the Balfour Declaration backing, quote, the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, end quote. The Balfour Declaration was nowhere more joyously celebrated than in the Darbyite and British Israelite congregations in England and America. But the joy had little to do with the Jewish people. Indeed, these people didn't believe that the Jewish people were really the Jews. So why set up a country for people that they did not believe were the Jews to rebuild the Temple of Solomon in order to bring their prophecy to pass and raise them, elevate them to the position of master race with the royal family of England identified as the only direct descendants of the truly holy bloodline with the divine right to rule related to Jesus Christ who was also of the house of David. You see how these lies and this manipulation works? <laughs> While saying that the Jewish people are not really the Jewish people, they want to recreate the state of Israel with the Jewish people that they claim are the subrates. <laughs> I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, these people are sick. Literally sick, mentally ill. Except for the ones who are really inventing the lies and pulling the strings and doing the real manipulating, they know exactly what they're doing. And there's nothing insane about them at all. They don't believe their own lies. They just believe that it's going to carry them into a world government that they will then rule. And that's what you need to really understand. For that's really the heart and soul of all of this. The common man has never been told the truth throughout the history of the world except by a very few people. And when those very few people told the common man the truth, they generally did not ever believe them, choosing instead to believe the lies. I find it absolutely amazing, for the truth, elusive though it may be, can be found by anyone who wants to take the time to look for it. The so-called patriot community in the United States of America and some militia organizations are permeated with these people who call themselves Christian identity or British Israelites. There is nothing patriotic about them. They exist solely to be manipulating and destroying the United States of America and the Christianity which they claim to be so much a part of. And that's the truth of the matter. These are truly subversive organizations. And they're not in the best interest of anyone who believes truly in liberty and freedom for all people, regardless of race, religion, or point of ancestral origin. The consolidation that took place in 1919, uniting the 40-odd British Israelite organizations, followed two developments that were the work of British leaders who had been influenced by British Israelism. The first was the 1917 conquest of Palestine and entry into Jerusalem by Field Marshal Lord Allenby. The result 
ladies and gentlemen, of the ultimate formation of the state of Israel. To be peopled by the very people that the British Israelites claimed were not the Jews. This Balfour Declaration that was the precedent for all that followed was celebrated in the Darbyite and British Israelite congregations in England and America but the joy had little to do with the Jewish people ladies and gentlemen indeed they didn't even believe they were the Jewish people but imposters as they tell you today mud people as they called them indeed many of these celebrants were anti-Semites who would soon join the revived Ku Klux Klan the issue was the final fulfillment of the biblical prophecy. And then, and then, the end of the world, these people said. But I tell you, that's not going to happen either. Because that's not what Jesus Christ said. Is it? He didn't say there was going to be an end of the world. Neither does the original Bible. And every Bible that says it's going to be the end of the world is a mistranslation the original word in the Greek and the Hebrew means age. It will be the end of the age. Both British Israelism and Darby's prophetic apocalypticism were surprisingly welcome in America. Since both contained a Gnostic core belief, they were not altogether foreign to the theological ideas of many transplanted Puritans. Large factions of the American Puritans could easily be classed as Gnostics. Some early Puritan settlers even came up with a version of Israelism and believed that Native Americans were among the lost tribes of Israel. You know that is the Mormon Church, or the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. And again, folks, I don't care what religion you belong to, that's up to you as long as you belong to it in the truth. As long as you know the truth and you choose to still believe in any way, I'll fight and die for your right to worship at that altar. It only becomes bad when you and believing your religion try to foist your religion on the rest of us. Make us conform to your world view. Try to make everyone who believes in liberty and freedom eat and drink and think and live and sleep bow down to whoever you bow down to. That's wrong. And I don't care what religion it is that you belong to. I'm talking to everybody listening to this broadcast. Everybody. Live your life. Believe what you wish. Worship at whatever altar you wish. I will support that even unto death. I will not support your attempting to take away my liberties and freedom to invoke whatever your particular religion or belief believes should be my government or my life. That I will oppose also unto death. The idea that there was the remnant of the lost tribes of Israel in America was sufficiently widespread that it had to be attacked by Cotton Mather, the Puritan humanist. Right or wrong, this is the history of it. The continued effect of Puritan forms of Gnosticism and its use by Britain can be seen in the work of Jonathan Edwards, who started the first big wave of revivalism in the first half of the 18th century. After studying Locke's psychological doctrines, Edwards came up with his own theory of religious affections. The realization that rhetorically conjuring up horrific images of hellfire might have a dramatic effect on susceptible minds, his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, with images of the sinner's soul as a tiny spider held by a thread over a pit of everlasting torture, created a preaching format still used today. With all of that emerged from 
a well-known classic known as Dante's Inferno. The concept of a hell where there is a perpetual fire burning the souls of sinners did not exist until that book was published. Edward's Great Awakening succeeded in creating mass hysteria in large parts of the Northeast, coming into direct conflict with American leaders like Benjamin Franklin and other followers of Cotton Mather, who wanted to fire up the population to build a nation. Edward's son-in-law was Aaron Burr, the murderer of Alexander Hamilton, who presided over the American chapter of the British Hellfire Club, the secret society devoted to the philosophy of Bernard de Mandeville, who argued against any interference by the state in private vices, no matter how satanic. And that is the identifying mark of an Illuminist. It was Burr who saw that Edwards was made president of the House of Orange's Princeton University. Now, folks, neither Darbyism nor Israelism were very popular in themselves in America through the 19th century, although the British attempted unsuccessfully to capitalize on biblical prophecies about Russia, known as the evil God, to undermine Abraham Lincoln's civil war alliance with Russia. Many of you know nothing about that. At the turn of the 20th century, coinciding with the British efforts to bring America into a strategic alliance, both pre-millennial dispensationalism and British Israelism began to expand. Most of you don't understand that England sided with the South during the Civil War, hoping to split the United States of America in half so that England could eventually reconquer this continent. Britain supplied a constant stream of preachers for United States prophecy conferences, whose message was that the secrets of the scripture were being decoded and were coming to pass, that wars and rumors of wars portended the Jewish return, the tribulation, and the rapture. The Darbyite theories were assembled in a series of pamphlets, several edited in England, called The Fundamentals, A Testimony of Truth. <laughs> Far from it. These pamphlets, which included the statement that although man was originally made in the image of God, he had lost that honor by Adam's sin, circulated in the millions in the United States. Indeed, the reason why many Protestant evangelicals and apocalyptics are called fundamentalists is that they adhered to the fundamentals described in these pamphlets. Meanwhile, British Israelism grew. The first American organization based on the writings of Edward Hines, the reigning British Israelite, was the 1879 Lost Israel Identification Society of Brooklyn, created by Joseph Wilde, the pastor of Brooklyn's Union Congregationalist Church. In 1883, C.A.L. Totten, who was a United States Army officer, wrote, Palestine regained are the relation of our race to the race of Israel, the means toward the end. That writing was based on the work of Hine, who toured the Northeast for four years, starting in 1884. And a clue to its agenda is the end sentence of the subtitle, The Means Toward the End. There were two, two American delegates to the 1919 founding of the BIWF in London, namely J.H. Allen and Portland, Oregon pastor Reuben Sawyer. The latter was a Darbyite who came to incorporate British Israel into his views. Sawyer was replaced as the United States representative to the BIWF by Howard Rand, a lawyer who ran for Attorney General of Massachusetts on the Prohibition Party ticket. In 1930, Rand founded the BIWF-affiliated Anglo-Saxon Federation of America, which soon had chapters all across the United States. There has been an intermingling of British Israelism with major Protestant evangelical denominations ever since that time. For example, Garner Ted Armstrong, the founder of the Worldwide Church of Christ, preached that the Anglo-Saxon Celtic race was the true Israelites and that the British sovereign was descended from King David. Upon his death, his church split between adherents of British Israelism and those who believed in, 
quote, the rapture, end quote. Likewise, Billy Graham, who founded the Evangelistic Association, got his first training from a British Israelite named Mordecai Ham. Graham rose to prominence after his revival meetings in Britain, where he became associated with such British Israelite influence notables as Lord Holm of the Herschel. Graham's writings were published by the leading BIWF geopolitician Kenneth Hugh de Courcy in his publication Religious Review. Although Graham seeks to keep it hidden, some of his closest advisors practice capitalistic biblical prophecy from the signs of the time. Another offshoot of British Israelism that has permeated the United States, posing a significant national security problem, and that is no exaggeration, is the Identity Church. It agrees that the Anglo-Saxon Celtic race is the true Israelites, but differs from the BIWF by proclaiming the Jews to be descended from Eve's mating with the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Identity has significant influence within a number of paramilitary groups, and in the militias, some few militias, ladies and gentlemen, don't denigrate or condemn the militias, for only a very few are affected by this cancer. And you can tell exactly which ones they are. They'll tell you that you can't be a true American or belong to the militia unless you are a Christian, and specifically Christian identity person. So, they're not hard to pinpoint. That makes them not militias but religious armies. The true militia, ladies and gentlemen, is defined in the law of every state and of the United States of America. There are an awful lot of so-called patriots, however, who are Christian identity, British Israelites. These people also believe that Hitler was right and that Hitler's Third Reich was the promise and should have been allowed to come about. Hitler's one of their big heroes, and they include the Aryan race, as does the modern British Israelite movement anyway, and in England, even after having said that they were not <laughs> part of the original ten tribes of Israel, but were the Assyrian enemies of the tribes of Israel, and now they are once again of the tribes of Israel. You see, it's all convenient. Too convenient. This Christian identity also has significant influence, ladies and gentlemen, with factions within the United States Intelligence Community, the Central Intelligence Agency, and military units such as the Special Forces. One famous member of which was Lieutenant Colonel James Bo Gratz, who is one of the biggest Trojan horses that exists in this country today. This influence of British Israel upon paramilitary and patriot organizations in the United States is long standing. William Pellet, who founded the Silver Shirts in imitation of the Nazi. Stum Abtilung, or S.A., in the 1930s, was one such case. Others include Reverend Gerald L.K. Smith, who created the American Destiny Foundation, and then formed the paramilitary California Anti-Communist League. Reverend Wesley Smith, who founded two paramilitary groups, the California Rangers and the Christian Defense League. Lieutenant Colonel William Potter Gale, retired, who first worked with Smith's Defense League, then broke off to found the Posse Comitatus, and so forth. And that brings us to Kenneth Hugh de Courcy. Mr. de Courcy subsequent... <coughs> Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. I need to get a little drink of water here. De Courcy, a protege of British SIS Chief Sir Stuart Menzies, was born November 6th in 1909. He was the son of the claimant to the title of the 8th Duke de Grants Menil, which is a dubious title of Anglo-Norman origin, 
nonetheless given credence as an honorary by de Brett's peerage. De Corsi has had numerous high-level associations, associates, I should say, within the Club of the Isles, and he is one of the leading apologists for the House of Windsor's involvement in the drive to impose Adolf Hitler upon a prostate Germany for a drive to the east against Russia. Among his Club of the Isles friends who were involved in the project were His Royal Highness Duke George Duke of Kent, who was also a leader of the United Grand Lodge of England, and King Edward VIII, who was forced to abdicate because of his pro-Nazi views, when by 1936 a faction of the Club of the Isles had come to see Hitler as a dangerous Frankenstein monster. Of course, he remained faithful to the Duke of Windsor, even after the Duke was known to have entered into negotiations with Hitler to be restored to the throne of England by the Wehrmacht. De Corsi was very close to the evangelical Lord Holm of the Herschel, who was with Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain at Munich. However, the egotist Kenneth Hugh de Corsi made the mistake of placing some of his records on file at the Hoover Institution's archives, including a document he claims he wrote in Wormwood Scrubs Prison while serving a sentence there for financial fraud. This document concerns his own role in the escape of convicted Soviet spy and suspected British triple agent George Blake in October 1966. Some United States intelligence sources believe that Blake did more damage to United States interests than British triple agent H.A.R. Kim Philby, whom you've all heard of. In his latest prophecy appearing in the pages of Corsi's Intelligence Digest and Special Office, he is once again claiming that there will be a renewed Middle East war by 1998, that's this year, that will escalate into World War III. And ladies and gentlemen, if you can see all of the information that I gather here from all of my people worldwide, I would not, I would not reject that as an offhand ridiculous statement. It's very possible, and it could actually occur. According to Bukorsi, Russia is assisting Iran and Syria to prepare for such a war through the transfer of nuclear technology. In order to save Israel, the British will have to rely upon the United States arsenal to obliterate the Russian-Syrian-Iranian alliance. Should President Bill Clinton, who of course he states hates Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, balk at this escalation, then the British will destroy Clinton by playing their Trump card. Sixty million evangelicals in the United States. The situation is such that Netanyahu may himself launch a preemptive nuclear strike. Otherwise, de Corsi said that China was doing everything it could to maneuver Russia into an alliance with Iran for the forthcoming Middle East War. The reason is that Russia is extremely weak militarily. It has only a strategic missile capability left after having decimated its other military units, and that's what they want the world to believe. It is not true, ladies and gentlemen. If there is a new Middle East war, then he foresees China might move to take eastern Russia, which he claims has been a long-term goal. It would be impossible, given China's vast population and territorial depth, for it to be conquered by Russia or by anybody else, for that matter. Of course, his latest prophecy is a reliable expression of the viewpoint of a powerful faction within the Club of the Isles. As a leader of BIWF in London pointed out, King George VI had had his genealogical chart traced back to King David, and he educated his daughters in British Israelism, including his heir, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Now, who are you going to believe, folks? <laughs> For I tell you that everyone who believes in this scam of British Israelism or Christian identity is, in effect, and in reality, calling Jesus Christ a liar. If you don't believe that, listen to their version of the world's history, and then go read the words in red in your Bible. 
Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me. He didn't say, suffer the little white children to come unto me. He did not say, suffer the little Anglo-Saxon Aryan children to come unto me. He did not say, suffer the little black children to come unto me, or the little red children, or the little yellow children. He said, suffer the little children to come unto me. He said, whosoever believeth in me shall have everlasting life. He said a lot of other things, ladies and gentlemen. All that say the same thing. That he was, if you're a Christian, and you must believe this if you're a Christian, he was the salvation of all humanity. He was the end of all pain and suffering. He was the standard around which all people, rich and poor, sick, healthy, lame, black, White, yellow, red, purple, green, I don't care. To end all of the wars and bring about God's kingdom on this earth. Anybody who tells you anything different from that is calling Jesus Christ a liar. If you don't believe me, you read his own words in red in the Holy Bible. If you don't believe in Christianity, or even in any other religion, the answer to the problems of the world is not the Mormon Church. It is not the Southern Baptist Church. It is not the Seventh-day Adventists. It is not the Presbyterians. It is not British Israelism. It is not atheism. It is simply to follow the teachings and the admonishments of the greatest men who have ever lived upon the face of this earth, one of which was Jesus Christ, who told us the truth, and we haven't listened yet. And even though we have his words at our disposal, within arm's reach in almost every home or in every library throughout the world, People still go and listen to these lies and believe them. Go back and read that Jesus Christ contradicted every single thing that these people are teaching you and you still don't understand it. Can't get it through your head. He said, Wheresoever you shall gather in my name, there shall I be also. He did not say, wheresoever you who are Anglo-Saxon Aryan gather in my name, there I will be also. Or there shall I be also. He didn't say that. He didn't put black in there. He didn't put yellow in there. He didn't put red in there. All of these people are using it. They're lying to you. Once again, they're deceiving you and manipulating you. And they're hating each other and accomplishing the exact opposite of what Jesus Christ set out to accomplish. And so if you call yourself a Christian, you must reject these things. But you must not believe me just because I say it. You go to your Bible. And don't you dare read any other word except those printed in red. Or if you're a Christian, those are the only ones that matter. No other word in that entire Bible matters save those words. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. And God bless each and every single one of you.